Today, I'm going to present from my book, The Origin of Humanity and Evolution. So there are two key issues which we need to address. One is how to interpret the scientific data and how to interpret the Bible. Now, uh, as for the scientific data, I think um, Dr. Craig and Ken Kenton has already said something about that. And uh, Josh Somidas, I will highly recommend his work on uh, this issue on concerning the scientific data. Now, as for the biblical text, how do we interpret it properly? Well, we need to consider the following factors. We need to consider the literary genre, the context, the meaning of the words in the original language, the grammar, and also the historical background and concerns of the biblical authors. And as well as the reception history, how the early readers understood the text. Now, we should be careful not to interpret the Bible in accordance with our present scientific knowledge. This will be the area of concordism, but in accordance with the above mentioned principles. Okay, and we also need to distinguish between the task of interpreting the Bible, uh, which I call task A, and showing that the biblical account is true, and showing that there is no incompatibility between evolution and Bible, which I call task C. Now, we need no difference between, say, for example, saying that the Bible teaches the Big Bang, evolution, etc., and saying that the Bible does not contradict the Big Bang, evolution, etc. Right, so these uh, two propositions are different. And I, I'm arguing for the second one, right? And so this is task C. For this task, it is perfectly legitimate to suggest a possible model which the human biblical authors may not have thought of as long as the possibility is not contradictory to what they expressed. Okay, so I'm not going to say that uh, you know, the biblical authors actually talk about evolution. I mean, that's, that's not true. Um, I'm not going to say that the biblical authors actually said what my model said. Right? That, uh, I'm not claiming that, right? but rather I'm providing a possible model in, in the accordance with task C, um, which the human biblical authors you know, they may not have thought of, but it's not contrary to what they express. Okay, so this is some of the key elements of my model for the purpose of task C for showing that there's no incompatibility between evolution and the Bible. Okay, so this is a possible model which distinguishes between anatom anatomical homo, possessing the image of God, and I call this God's image bearers, and I define them as equivalent with human beings, and distinguish this from anato anatomical homo, which did not possess the image of God. And on my model, God took a pre-existent anatomical homo, or, or created one de novo, and make him, Adam, to be the first God's image bearer. Okay, so on my model, Adam was the first human being. Okay. And so on this point, I differ a bit from uh, Somidas' uh, uh, book, which you know, he, he defend uh, this possibility, but he also defend another possibility on which you know, Adam was not the first human being. Right? So, but on my view, I affirm uh, that Adam was the first human being. Okay, so that, that is one difference between uh, my work and Somitas. And on my model, uh, the image of God was passed down from you know, this, the first human being, Adam, to his descendants, and that all humans today could have him as common ancestor, even though they descended from a large population of anatomical homo, as indicated by population genetics. Okay, so my, my model is also consistent with population genetics. Uh, just as Dr. Craig's model is consistent with population genetics. And some, on my model, some descendants of Adam could have mated with non-human anatomical homo, which contributed to the genetic diversity, but their descendants were nevertheless fully human. Okay, so these are the key elements of my model, and I argue that the existence of historical Adam is compatible with evolutionary biology, as well as evolution, which includes uh, evolutionary population genetics. And in my book, I also argue that both the ancient GAE model and the recent GAE model are defensible possibilities. So I don't insist on a recent GAE view, even though in the Four Views book, I'm defending a recent GAE view, right, because I was asked to do so. Uh, yeah, even though I myself actually slightly prefer the ancient one, actually. Uh, nevertheless, I, I do also think that the uh, recent JE model is still defensible at this point in time, um, but I don't insist on it. And so my own view does not strictly require this. Okay? Which means that even if the recent JE model is disproved, it doesn't disprove what I defend in my book. 
And the third point is that if somebody claims that science has shown that Adam does not exist, then the burden of proof will be on him or her to disprove both the ancient and the recent GA model. Okay? Let me say a bit more about task A, the task of interpreting the scripture. So how do I understand the genre of Genesis 1 to 11? Now, there are different scholars have different uh, views about this, but my model is compatible with all of them. My own view is that it, the genre defies simple classification. I, I see a complex interweaving of genres, which include poetry, hymn, doctrine in narrative mode. Um, and I also see a, an interest in the chronology, right? This can be seen from the genealogies, uh, a causal explanation of the sequence of events in the dim and distant past. So in that sense, you can call it proto-history. And I also see that the biblical authors, you know, they, they put Adam in the ancestor list, and this indicate that the biblical authors are treating Adam as a historical person. So the biblical authors do affirm a historical Adam, right? So I, I think on this point, all, all four of us agree, actually. As to the final details of the interpretation, say, for example, how do we understand the six days of creation? I agree with the view of Professor John Collins, who is an eminent Old Testament scholar. Uh, uh, he, he was the editor of the uh, ESV translation. Right? He, he argues in his book, Reading Genesis Well, which is an excellent book. I recommend it to everyone who, who wants to read Genesis Well. Okay, so in this book, he argues that Genesis 1.1 describes the initial bringing into existence of all things. Verse 2 describes the condition under which the first day began in verse 3. And, and so you know, it, allow, it allows for a gap of duration of time between verse 1 and verse 2. And moreover, the six days are analogical. Uh, so the six days, which, which is also mentioned in Exodus chapter 20, verse 11, are God's activity of shaping physical reality to provide a suitable habitat for humankind to live, to love, and to serve. And so this interpretation implies that one does not have to hold to a young creationist view. The Bible doesn't strictly insist or require this uh, young, the, the young creationist view. Now, as to the flood, uh, Noah's flood, which I think Canton mentioned just now, he thinks that this is a big issue, right? Uh, now, I agree with other Old Testament scholars, uh, Tramper Longman and John Walton, who have argued in their book, The Lost World of the Flood, you know, they argue that based on the genre analysis of the text, and this is derived from careful comparative literature analysis of ancient Near Eastern texts and apocalyptic literature, we can understand the flood as a local flood described rhetorically in hyperbolic language as a worldwide flood to make a theological point. And so the flood does not have to be understood as covering the entire globe as we understand it today, but merely of sufficient extent for destroying the world of the ungodly humans. So it is universal in the sense that it destroyed all human beings, except Noah and his family, right? But it is universal in that sense, but it doesn't require it to cover the entire globe. Why? Because human beings, you know, they have not yet spread across the whole earth by the time of the flood. I want to emphasize that you know, this interpretation is not made as a compromise to modern science, no, but it's based on proper hermeneutical, hermeneutical principles, right? Analyzing the genre, uh, which, um, <laughs> I mentioned just now is a proper hermeneutical principle and which uh, Professor Longman and Walton, they, they explain in great detail in their book. So it is a well-grounded interpretation and this interpretation also implies that you know, the flood doesn't have to be covering the whole earth. Now as to the image of God, I agree with uh, Professor Richard Everbeck, another uh, eminent Old Testament scholar, that the biblical text clearly focuses on our vocation or function with, within the rest of creation. There's no mention here of the metaphysical capacities on which the structuralist view focuses its attention. Um, but this does not deny the fact that God gave us the capacities to function the way he had intended. Right, so the primary focus of big authors is on the function, but it does not exclude the, the metaphysics or the capacities as well, even though that's not the main focus, right, the main um, emphasis of the big authors. So with this in mind, I understand the image of God as saying, as referring to the election by God of Adam and his, and his descendants for the role or the function of royal representatives. That is, for a kind of dominion that could extend to the whole world and over all kinds of creatures, 
a sense of responsibility towards the creator gods and other creatures for this kind of dominion and becoming conformed to Christ. Okay, so, so this is what the biblical text emphasize. Now, I want to highlight here that you know, just uh, merely having abstract thinking or blending death or innovativeness or symbolic behavior, or even the use of wood, which Dr. Craig mentioned just now in his, in his talk, right? Uh, well, those are impressive, but those are not sufficient um, for, this, uh, for implying these characteristics, uh, which I listed here according to the Bible. So, you no know, having um, abstract thinking, etc., right, does not imply having um, the ability to have a kind of dominion that could extend across the whole world, or a sense of uh, or uh, the capacity to be aware to be aware of a creator God and to worship God, right? So uh, these capacities and functions which I listed here about uh, about the image of God, which the Bible emphasizes, um, this may have been acquired much later on. It could have been more far more recent compared to seven hundred thousand years ago, uh, which Doctor Craig argues for. Right. Um, just as agriculture and writing were acquired later, right? So agriculture is only about uh, ten thousand or twenty thousand years ago, and writing is only about a few thousand years. Right? Those were acquired later on. So when we want to uh, understand what does hu a human being means, how do we? What do we mean by a human being? We need to read the Bible to have a good understanding of that, and the Bible tells us that you know, it is this function that defines a human being. Right. Okay. So um, we should go by this definition. And when we go by this definition, we find that you know, actually the, um, the, the recent uh, GAE view is defensible as well, right? because uh, we do not have good evidence yet to show that this function go all the way back to 700,000 years ago or, or even before 10,000 years ago. Right? So, uh, but I mean, I'm not excluding the possibility that um, in the future, scientists may discover this evidence. Who knows? Right? Maybe a few years later, scientists may discover the evidence that, oh, you know, 700,000 years ago, the pe people are already aware that there's a creator God, right? And if scientists do discover this evidence, I think it will make Dr. Craig very happy. <laughs> it will confirm Dr. Craig's hypothesis. It will make him very, very happy. But at this point in time, there isn't any such evidence yet. And so I think we should be careful and cautious right, not to insist that it must be a very ancient Adam. Um, I think we have to be open to various possibilities. Uh, um, and also because of the reason, you know, scientific evidence, uh, scientific findings you know, sometimes change over time, right? So we, we should be also be very careful not to jump in, you know, to, or, or into that this or that view, but to leave the possibilities open, right? Uh, we shouldn't close ourselves unnecessarily. Now, concerning the creation of human beings after Adam, in the history of Christian thought, there are various views, such as creationism, which is that God created the souls directly, and traditionism, which um, says that you know, God created the gametes with, to be the carriers of solis potentialities, such that you know, these potentialities are passed down to the descendants. Now, my model is compatible with either traditionism or creationism, right? So um, on traditionism, one can argue that right, reproduction improving Adam's descendants occur, the unique human capacity in the soul, as well as the election, the function, right, will be passed to the offspring. Well, creationists can postulate that God keeps track of the human lineage and create a human soul whenever reproduction involving Adam's descendants occur. Now, my model also affirmed that all people today, all anatomical homo today around the world, <coughs> are indeed descendants of Adam. And this is based on a traditional interpretation of Acts chapter 17, verse 26, which says that from one, God made all nations to inhabit the whole earth. And so this implies that before the first century AD, where this verse was written, people of different nations were already descendants of one. From a theological perspective, an omnipotent God has the power to ensure that this is true. From a scientific perspective, this is compatible with science as well. Why? Because scientists have discovered that the answer to the question, how far back in time must we go to find an individual who was the ancestor of all present-day humans, now, this most recent common ancestor, MRCA, is surprisingly recent. Okay, so on my model, um, Adam doesn't have to be the most recent one. He just has to be a common ancestor, right? But the fact that the, the MRCA you know, just requires a few thousand years you know, is, shows that you know, my model is com compatible with science as well. And so this uh, scientific conclusion has been published in well-respected scientific journals like Nature, for example. And Somidas has also 
uh, defended this view and responded to the objection by Kelleher and also Marcus Ross, who uh, has used Kelleher right, to argue against this conclusion, but uh, Somidas uh, has replied by arguing that uh, Kelleher, you know, his objection is based on problematic assumptions, right? assuming that human beings only walk a few kilometers uh, throughout their entire life, which is uh, not very plausible. Uh, human beings will have uh, traveled to uh, uh, walk a greater distance compared to just a few kilometers, right, their entire life. And so they have uh, that's, you know, spread across much um, more efficiently. And that would uh, be part of the reason why right, for accounting for how uh, that is, it is scientifically plausible that all anatomical homo today are, in that, are indeed uh, descendants of one, right? That's what the Bible says. And so all human beings today could have very recent common ancestor, say for example, just a few thousand years would be enough. Even if substantial forms of population subdivision exist with low rate of migration. And the burden of proof will be on those who disagree to show otherwise. And so um, with this and with what I explained so far, it can be seen that the existence of a historical Adam is compatible with evolutionary biology. And this conclusion is hugely significant for the church because perceived conflicts have resulted in people, especially many young people nowadays, adopting and leaving the Christian faith, which is unnecessary, right? Because of what I explained. And this conclusion is also hugely important for evangelism and missionary work. Say, for example, uh, the missionary work to China and India, two of the world's largest populations. Because many people in China and India, right, they embrace mainstream science, uh, evolution biology. And resolving you know, this area of perceived conflict by showing that in actuality there's no conflict right, is very important for evangelism and missionary work. And finally, this conclusion is hugely important for our cultural mandate as God's image bearers by allowing science and Christianity to work closer together for the good of humanity. Amen. <laughs>